note at the beginning of the psalm. This is a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. And that's the story we're going to talk about today. But here's what he says. He says, O Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? And they're saying of me, God will not deliver him. Will, will not deliver him. But you're a shield about me, God. My glorious one who lifts up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud. And he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. And I wake again because the Lord sustains me. And I won't fear tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord. And deliver me, O my God. From the Lord comes deliverance. What, what's interesting about the psalm here is it's a, a song he wrote. He says, many are saying of me that God won't rescue him. But I know you'll come through. And he, and he puts his trust in there. Now, we've been going through a series of sermons about King David, uh, one of the great heroes in the uh, in the uh, Old Testament, and, and, uh, and, uh, and kind of the mark in Israel of what a, what a perfect king is supposed to look like. And yet, a few weeks ago, we talked about how David, though he had all this potential and there were all these good things about him, uh, he makes this a fantastic, gigantic mistake. And, and, and uh, it's easy sometimes when people are talking about, mis- like if somebody were to come and pray with me after the service, say, hey, you know, I've been making a mistake. Hey, nobody's perfect, I'll say. But the stuff that David did, it's, it's intense. Uh, stole somebody's wife and had the other man killed. And, and, uh, and uh, just, just, I mean, it's, it's really, really ugly, ugly stuff. And, and, and so you have this king who has all this, that's probably what the pictures illustrate, and all this potential, and yet his sin, his own humanity, sometimes conspires against him to undo him. And that's kind of what inspired that psalm. That, that many are saying that, okay, he's finally getting what's coming to him. He's finally going to get, you know, knocked back and God's not going to come through. But David says, I'm going to trust in you, God, to come through. And I want to think about that as we look at this story in the Old Testament. I was tempted to skip it because it's a lot of, uh, it's just a lot of narrative and, and a lot of, uh, uh, it's hard to find a hero and all. Everybody looks kind of bad all the way through it. Everybody looks kind of shady. But it's like five chapters in the Old Testament. Uh, the guys who wrote it down thought it was a pretty important thing for us to know about, and it eats up a lot of space. And so, so I I I, I wanted to go through it. Uh, uh, so so here's what it's about: uh, the, the the five chapters. It's it, it's the continuing fallout of 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 the mistake that David made. And I talked about that earlier, where he he cheated and had someone killed. He 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 has this really low moment. The Bible says in a different place: Do not be deceived that God cannot be mocked, and a man is going to reap what he sows. So, and I think this is kind of a principle of life. I think it's bigger than just uh, his argument in Galatians chapter 6. It's, it's something that you can take kind of as a rule of life. That if you spend your life going after the wrong things, sooner or later you're going to receive the benefit of that. And if you spend your life going after the right things, then sooner or later you'll receive the benefit of that. Sooner or later uh, you are what you've invested in. Don't be deceived. God can't be mocked. And, and for David, because of some of the mistakes he made, there was even a prophecy given. A, a guy named Nathan says, because of all the stuff that you've done, the sword is never going to leave your house. And, um, and that happened. I mean, last week we talked about some of that. We talked about, um, uh, or two weeks ago, we talked about uh, David's oldest son was a guy named Ammon. And uh, Ammon saw how his dad took another man's wife, how his dad just took whatever he wanted. And Ammon was in love with his half-sister, and so he rapes her. And it's an awful, gross, ugly, terrible story. And, uh, and, uh, and his, the, the sister was his half-sister through David. David was the common father. But, 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 but his, her full brother, mom and dad the same, uh, was, was Absalom, who we're going to talk about a lot today. And Absalom sees this awful thing happen to his sister. You can imagine what that would do to you if, you're, if your sister or somebody like that was hurt in that way. You'd just be furious mad. And Absalom waits for two years. He makes a plot that takes two years to come true, and he kills his older brother. And so this prophecy made to David, the sword's never going to leave your house. Um, it's coming true. And we're seeing all this ugliness. And Absalom has to run for his life for three years. And, uh, and David forgives him for it which you can argue about the wisdom of that, uh, but he forgives him for it, but it's kind of a half forgiveness. He allows Absalom to come back because Ammon probably had it coming, it was the thinking, but, but he won't see him, he won't talk to him, he, he kind of keeps a distance from him. And Absalom spends 
uh, uh, three years uh, not talking to David at all. Uh, I, I, I was away from David, and then another two years back in the city not talking to David at all. So it's a real messed up house. And all of that happens before the stuff that we're talking about today. But you need to understand all that, that anger and the resentment and the buildup of all that, that David is seen by most of people as this great, great guy, but, but the guys in his family see a different side. So some of you know what that's like. And, and you got Absalom, and he's just boiling for years and years and years about his dad. Uh, just, just anger for years and years and years about his dad. And, and some of you know what that's like. So that's, that's the, the guys we're going to talk about uh, today. So to, just to introduce you to, uh, to Absalom, it says, In all of Israel there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. This is kind of unusual, scripturally speaking. Uh, scripturally speaking, it doesn't normally give us very much to go on but what these guys looked like. We don't know what Abraham looked like or Noah. I mean, we don't have an idea uh, what, these, what they look like. Paul, it never tells us anybody what Paul looks like. We don't know what he looks like. But Absalom, it tells you that he was just a fantastically handsome dude. And in fact, if you had a contest, he'd win. He was the most handsome guy in the, in the whole. Nobody was praised as highly as him. And from the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. Just completely good-looking guy. And whenever he cut the hair of his head, and it makes a point about this too, uh, he had these rich, luxurious uh, locks of hair. Uh, he had to cut his hair once a year because it was just so heavy. He'd weigh it, and it was 200 shekels, which is like five pounds. It's like five, three to five pounds of, of hair that he would grow every year. Just, just this huge mane on the top of his head. Now, I was talking to Josh Halton about this th- th- this week. There are AI programs, stuff like uh, Mid Journey and, uh, and uh, Canva and a few others that you can, you can type in little clue words of what you'd like to see, and the computer can make, an, make a predictive guess of what, what that would look like. For instance, uh, you can type in, Google has a bunch of these, like AI, uh, Jesus takes a selfie, and then this picture pops up. And uh, Jesus didn't really take a selfie, right? He didn't have a cell phone. But, but, but you, can, you can type it in and get an idea of what it would have looked like. Or, or there's another one, Jesus takes a selfie. I found this one too. Jesus takes a selfie, and there's this picture. And did it look like that? Well, probably not. The guy on the, on the right of Jesus has got glasses. I don't think they had glasses back then. But, but, but maybe, maybe it could have looked something like that. So Josh is telling me about these programs. And he says, you know, I could, take, I could type in about Absalom and give you a picture of what he might have looked like. What's well, a great idea. And so he types in the uh, handsomest man in all the kingdom, rich, luxurious locks, and I get this picture back. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's exactly what he looked like, but, but really handsome guy, okay? So you get that picture in your head. Anyway, so in the course of time, uh, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and, and, uh, and, and horses, and he had 50 men to run in front of him. So he's, it, there's a, a proverb in, in contemporary uh, uh, like business, dress for the job that you want to have, not the job that you currently have. And that's kind of what Absalom's doing. And so he starts carrying himself like a king. That's what kings did. And so Absalom starts to carry himself like a king, like he's not just one of the princes, but he's, he's the main guy. And it says he'd get up early in the morning, and he would stand by the gate. And when someone came into the city to, to, with a complaint, right, or, or something wasn't right uh, to, to give to the king, Absalom would reach out and call out to him. And he would say, oh, listen, hey, you've got some good things there. Your claims are valid and proper, but there's no representative of the king to hear you. Oh, he says, he says, uh, oh, that I might become uh, the, the uh, well, if only I was judge of the land, then I would hear what you have to say. Any case would come to me, and I'd listen to it, and I'd make sure you got justice. So what he's doing here, uh, uh, Absalom, is when anybody comes in, he's trying to find the complainers. He's trying to find the people who are mad about one thing or another, and he's collecting all of them to his side. Now, if you've ever worked in a big office, if you, well, truthfully, even in church, you can see this sometimes. There are people who do this, who do this thing, and, and they will, it just seems like every complainer finds their way to this desk. Every complainer in the, in the whole building finds their way to this one guy, and he kind of rabble-rouses it all together. And that's what Absalom's doing. And he's kind of building this whole army of people who are a little discontent about one thing or another. And he says, and whenever anybody would come and they'd see him, there was his chariot and his 50 men there around him, and he's looking like so, ro- and he's handsome, big hair. They said when they would, they, they, they'd, they'd bow down in front of him, he wouldn't let them. He'd pick them up, he'd say, hey, no, we're, 
we're, we're good. You and I, we're tight. And, 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 and it's all fake. There's no way that he really thought of these people as his equal, but he's, 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 he's politicking, right? And he did it for a long time. There's another verse that tells us he did this for four years. And, and he behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to him asking for justice. And he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. It's a, it's a four-year uh, plan. And, uh, and, I, and there's reasons. What's, what's, what's going on here? Why is Absalom doing this thing? And I think he's mad. I think he's angry at his dad. I think he's. I think D- David, uh, his older brother Am- uh, Ammon, a- Absalom's older brother, did that awful thing, and David didn't punish him for it. And so, so Absalom took matters in his own hand. And then after he did this awful thing, David still treated him like he was a bad guy. He was a bad guy, but David, he's mad at him. And so this this anger about his dad just boils and boils and boils and boils, and years and years go by. And he's complaining about his dad to anybody who will listen to him. And boy, you know, wouldn't we be better off if he wasn't king? And hey, hey, hey. And, and people start to respond. I do a thing um, where I try to keep track of the stuff that I'm, uh, that I'm preaching. I try to keep track of the stuff I get into. And my main reason to do it is, 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 is two, two or three things. I try not to speak on the same thing real close to, to each other. You know, give you a break if, before I get on some hobby horse. But I also kind of want to know, what themes are important to me. I, I think I can kind of, over a course of several years, you can see that certain things matter to me more than other things. I, I speak about them a lot. And, and one thing that is, a, is a, a theme with me is this issue of forgiveness. It seems like I talk about it a lot. And, uh, and there's a reason. Um, I think Jesus talked about it a lot. But, but I also think that, that lack of forgiveness has, has a particular power to wreck a person. You know, you can just grind and grind and grind about somebody else who did this awful thing to you, and it changes you. You, you find yourself having imaginary arguments before you go to bed at night. You're laying there in bed, but your mind is still racing about what you should have said or how you could have gotten even or how awful this other person was. And, and wouldn't it be great if they finally got what was coming to them? And, and, and it changes you. You become a different sort of person. You become harder, and you become more angry, and you, you're giving yourself an ulcer, and the person who hurts you is sleeping just fine. They don't even know you're mad. Or, or, or maybe they do know you're mad, but they don't care, and, and, and you're, 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 you're hurting yourself by holding on to this stuff. And I don't think that, that forgiveness means you automatically trust the other person. I don't think that. I mean, sometimes when trust is broken, then that's it. But this harboring, this, this holding on to the grudge, this, this just allowing yourself to boil about somebody else, I just don't see any wisdom in it at all. And I don't think Jesus did either. And I think that's why he talks so often about being quick to forgive and to forgive so easily. Paul Harvey used to be a, on the radio, as like a radio commentator, he used to be on the radio a lot, and he, would t- he told this story, it kind of stuck with me, about a, uh, how Eskimos will hunt for wolves, and uh, they'll take a knife, just razor sharp, and they'll coat it in blood, and they'll leave it out to freeze, and then do it again, and do it again, until finally there's quite a bit of, of frozen blood on top of this knife, and then they'll just bury the hilt of it into the snow there, so the blade is sticking up, and they'll leave it. And a wolf will find it, will smell it, and will start licking the blood off. And they'll get kind of crazy about it, the bloodlust of the whole thing, right? And they keep licking harder and harder and harder. And finally, they're licking their own blood. They're cutting themselves on the knife, but they're so fired up about this thing, they don't even realize they're licking their own blood. And and the next morning, the Eskimo goes out, and there's a dead wolf. And and they'll they'll kill themselves. They're they're, they're so motivated by the blood and and, uh, that, that, that they... They don't even realize when they start hurting themselves. They have a hard time separating that moment out. And I think people do that. And I've seen people do that. And and you've seen people do that. And maybe you've done that occasionally. And I'm not judging you. It's it's an easy hole to fall into. But I, I believe, the Bible doesn't say this exactly, but I believe that Absalom's in that hole. I think he has had years to, to resent his dad and how his dad has acted. I think he's had years to think about how he could do it better if he just had a chance. And so finally, uh, after all this time, he starts to, to grab at it. And it's, it's, a, it's the devil's bargain. I'll give you the whole world, the devil says. 
Just give me your soul. And so Absalom's going to grab for the kingship, and he's going to lose everything. But it's, it, it's what anger does to you. It's what unforgiveness does to you. So here's, i got a lot more scripture. So a messenger came and told David, hey, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. And so David gets all the officials with him in Jerusalem. He says, come, we got to get out of here. we gotta, we got to escape uh, from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he'll move quickly to overtake us, and he'll bring ruin upon us and put the whole city to the sword. Now, now, later in David's life, David, David's whole family life is a mess. And, and a lot of the resentment that Absalom has about him, that David didn't care, or David was distant, or David was in his own world, a lot of that's true. He's, he's right to think it. All those things are true. But, but, but David has another son named Adonijah. And when David's older, Adonijah is going to do a lot of the same thing. He's, Adonijah said, well, I'll be king. And he's going to announce it real big. And David doesn't even leave the city about Adonijah. He's not even worried about Adonijah. And I think that tells you a little something about the character of the two men. That Adonijah, he's not, he's not you know, you can just tell when somebody's ticked off. You know, it, it, you're in the same family together. They don't have to say it out loud. You can just tell. What's wrong with you today? Nothing. What's wrong with you? And, and, and you, know, you know something's going on. Little eye rolls and little the answers are just a little too fast or, or too short or, or too distant. Just, it's just subtle. Husbands and wives can do this to each other, you know, and uh, you, you answer the question, but you answer it, you're just a little slow to answer, or you have a little, uh, you, you kind of put emphasis on the wrong word or something, and, and, and they know it. Hey, what are you saying? I'm not saying anything. Why are you so sensitive? And, and you know there's just something going on, right? Well, I think David's felt this. He knows Absalom, who Absalom is. He knows what kind of guy he is, and he knows how angry he is. He knows how this has been building. And so when Absalom says that he's finally doing it, David gets out. David can see what's getting ready to happen, and, and he runs. And, and he, doesn't just, uh, he doesn't just run, but it says uh, Zadok, and Zadok is the high priest at this time. Zadok was there too, and all the Levites were with him, and they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. Remember the Ark is like the Rares of the Lost Ark. It's the Ark, they, they thought it was like God's throne. And so they're carrying it with David. David, the ark needs to go with you. And kings would do that, would drag God along with them, right, to show that they were the real king. And that, but David doesn't want to do that. And, and, and this is where David's a confusing study all the way through. He's capable of some really bad stuff. And there's really bad moments with David. But he's got, got, he's got a heart for God. And so he says, take the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, then he'll bring me back, and I'll, I'll see it, and I'll, I'll get a worship there again. But if, I, but if he's not pleased with me, then I'm ready to accept whatever God decides. And you could read this like a fatalism, but I don't think that's what's going on. I, I, think, I think David is, is finally maturing on some of this stuff. He's not going to try to control what happens. He knows who he is, and he knows who God is, and he's not going to try to manipulate that. If I can go off script here just for a minute, I thought Lance's communion meditation was, was really good, and, and I, I thought so first hour too, and it got me to thinking when he was talking about somebody saying, you know, what about this good person over here who's so good, would God really judge them and go to hell? When I hear stories like that, my first thought is, what's that got to do with me? Maybe there is a good guy over here, but I know who I am. I'm the guy who argues with his wife. I'm the guy who's not an attentive dad. I can't watch a Bluey cartoon without feeling guilty. That dad's a lot better dad than I am. And, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I see some, some of the stuff will come up, you know. Uh, the, my kids, I, I'm so proud of my kids. They're doing some things for their kids that I, I just didn't do. And I think, well, man, I know who I am. I'm the guy who cusses under my breath if I get passed on the interstate. I'm, I'm the guy who, who can have a hair trigger anger about something stupid, doesn't matter at all about anything. Can, can tell you uh, how the Pacers did last year, but have a hard time telling you about anything important. There may be some guy out there who's just so wonderful and good that God could not possibly send them to hell. But that doesn't have anything to do with me, right? I know who I am, and you know who you are. And, and, and again, you can fool people. You can fool people. You can fool a lot of people, but you're not fooling God. And, and hopefully you're not fooling yourself. We know who we are. You know this notion that, 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 that and it's, it's something that's talked about all the time in, 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 in church kind of stuff. You know, that, that you've got to be, 
any sin at all disqualifies you from God. And you can, in your head, make this tale, like even one sin? But that's not your problem. You've not got just one sin. You've got millions and millions of sins. I mean, just this morning, I, I, without getting into this, and I, this is not some secret prophecy that I have in my head. I can say this because it's true every week. There are people, there are couples sitting in here who really can't stand each other. There are families sitting in here who argued the whole way to church. There are people in here, in this room, who financially aren't sure how they'll keep their head above water. You know, it's this imaginary super good person that God, that's not us. And honestly, it's not people, right? And we try to manipulate God with those kinds of arguments. God, would you really, you know, condemn a person to hell when they're, when they're really just good people? Every one of you, if I was to do a quiz today, do you think you're good people? Well, yes, right? We all think we're good people, right? Everybody does. Sorry, a little rant, I, and I thought of it when, when he was talking, and, and, I, and I, I don't want to ruin anything he said. I thought, it was, I thought it was really good, everything he said. I don't want to, it was really smart, but it got me off on a, on a different tangent. David's no longer doing that, right? When the ark of God, they're going to bring it with him, David says, hey, if God wants me to be here, I'll be here. And if God doesn't, then I won't, and I'm okay with that. I'm going to trust in God. And there's a maturity in that. With all the bad things that David did, there's a maturity in that that's admirable. And uh, let me move on to the story. i got a lot more scripture uh, i got to get through. David, he, he's leaving the city, and he's walking up the Mount of Olives. He's weeping as he, as he went, and his head is covered, and he's barefoot. And all the people with him, they're all crying, and they're, they're, they're weeping too. And David had been told, Ahithophel is, a, is amongst the conspirators. That means nothing to us, Ahithophel. But Ahithophel is amongst the conspirators with Absalom. And, uh, and so David prayed, Lord, make Ahithophel's uh, counsel foolishness. And, and in those days, uh, the advice Ahithophel gave was like the advice of, of, of God. That's how both David and Absalom thought about Ahithophel's advice. So Absalom says to this Ahithophel, what do you think we should do? And Ahithophel says, well, here's what you do. You go sleep with your father's concubines. He left some women behind when he fled take care of the palace, you go sleep with them, and everybody will see it, and then, that'll, then they'll know that you've made yourself, a, it'll, it'll divide a hard wedge between you and your dad, and everybody will, will, will make a decision. And so they pitched a tent for Absalom up on the roof, and he, and he, and he slept with, he raped them. Now, now, this is worth thinking about here for a couple of things. This is what anger and rage and unforgiveness does to you. What was Absalom's big beef with David? Well, his sister was raped, and David didn't do anything. That was the beginning argument, right? And now he's had nine years or so to boil about that thing. Now he's turned into the very same kind of person that his dad was. And we, we, we all of us, don't we? We see this over and over and over again. A person grows up in a house where there's all this drinking and drunkenness. And they say, when I get my own house, I'm not doing that. And then they do that. Or you see a house where mom and dad are arguing all the time. When I get married, we won't do that at all. And then you do the very same thing. And, 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 the, and the weird thing is you, you blame them like they're some awful, terrible people. And then you find yourself going into the same hole they're going into. And that's what Absalom's doing. He's becoming the very monster that he thinks his dad is. But, but more, tenfold more than his dad ever was. There, there's also... It's kind of a trivia thing more than anything else. It mentions in Chronicles that Ahithophel was the father of a guy named Eliam. And with Bathsheba, when David and Bathsheba sinned, it mentions Bathsheba's dad was a guy named Eliam. And we don't know if Eliam's the same Eliam, but a lot of guys think, and I think, that, that Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandpa, that he was his, her, her grandfather. I, I think that's probably true. And because, because that Ahithophel's probably been boiling for a lot of years about David doing this awful thing. And, and now Ahithophel's given advice. They both become the very thing they said they were against. And that's what sin does. And that's what sin always does. So anyway, at the end of the deal, Ahith, Absalom's made himself obnoxious. Uh, David is on the run. David finally, okay, there's going to be a big battle to see who's the king. David, the king there, that's who the king is in this verse. The king is standing by the gate. And well, all the men marched out, uh, hundreds and, and thousands. And, and the king commanded his generals, uh, Joab and Abishai and Ittai, he commands them, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. 
And everybody heard him say it. Now, the normal penalty for this sort of treason is, is, uh, is, is death. That's the normal penalty for that. Even in countries today, that's the normal penalty for that. If you announce you're rebelling against the king, you better kill the king, because if you don't, it's going to be on your head. And, and, uh, but, but he says, be gentle with him. I'm going to forgive him. And whether that's a good idea or a foolish idea or just forgiveness, I don't know what it is, but David, be gentle with him. And the generals all hear that. Well, they, 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 uh, they go out and they fight. And the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. And, and Israel's troops were routed by David's men. And the casualties, 20,000. It was really ugly. And the battle spread out all over the countryside. And, and this is kind of a cool, this is literature more than anything else, kind of a cool line. The forest swallowed up more people that day than the sword. So the, the battle was in a woods. And there's all these canyons and caves and rocky areas. And people are hiding behind trees. And there's ambush. And you can just picture it's, it's like Rambo popping out of the cliffside, muddy. And he's, you know, it's that kind of thing. And, and, and a lot of blood. And it's gory and, and awful. And Absalom, he's in the middle of it. And he happened to meet some of David's men. He was riding his mule. And as the mule sped away under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. That's an irony is what that is. That's a, had this beautiful hair, and now his hair is the very thing that's getting him undone. And he, he, he left him hanging there in midair by his, hair, by his hair, and the mule kept it going. And Joab uh, took three spears, and he kills him. David told him to be gentle, but, but Joab won't do it. And Joab probably militarily is making the right decision, but it really wasn't his call to make. It was David's. And he knows that David will be angry about it. So he finds a foreigner to go take the news back, a guy, a Cushite. And the Cushite goes back to tell David, and he says, my Lord, the King, hear the good news. The Lord has rescued you, has a has uh, vindicated you today by delivering you uh, from the hand of, of those who rose up against you. And David asks him, he says, well, the young man Absalom, is he safe? And the Cushite says, may the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up and harm you be like that young man. So in other words, no, no, he's not safe. And it says uh, the king was shaken. Um, he leaves and he goes up over the gate and he's crying out, oh, Absalom, Absalom, uh, I wish it had been me, not you. And, and he just he, he, and he weeps loud enough that all the men coming back from battle hear him. And, and there's a, kind of a conflict there later on. Joab has to say, you need to be strong here. Your men are going to run out on you. You, you need to, they were, this had to be done. You know what had to be done. But, but this, this picture. And so I, 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 that's the story. And I, I wanted to talk about that just for a second. It seems like to me that a lot of our of people veer between David and Absalom. On the one side, we can be like Absalom and blame everything about our life on our circumstances. My parents are stupid. My parents are poor. My parents never cared. Or, or more recent, you know, uh, the, the teachers all look down on me. My, I don't ever get a fair shake at work. You know, I don't ever get, uh, I get treated bad because my family's not an important family. And we blame everybody else for what's going on except for ourselves. I think that's an easy thing to do. And a lot of people will, will, will veer to that pole. Or we, we veer to the David side of it. And we see this awful thing that we did, and we, we blame ourselves no matter what's going on. We blame ourselves for everything because of other people's decisions. You've got some guys like Absalom uh, uh, who, who will look out at the world and say, how can they be so stupid? And then you've got other people like David who look at the world and say, how can I have been so stupid? And, and, and it's paralyzing both times. I mean, for David, he can't make right decisions. He can't make right decisions to help raise his son, and he certainly doesn't make right decisions afterward. There's so much guilt from this awful stupid thing that he did, and, and there's no time machine, Right? You can't go back and erase it. You can't go back and fix it. You can't go back and take it back. Maybe you're a much better man or woman than you were 10 years ago, but it's, it's done. It's written down. You can't get away from it. It's just there. And some people are like David, and they, the weight of that just weighs them down all the time. And even for the people who hate us, it's my fault. You know, Absalom hates him, and it's, it's my fault. It's all my fault. And then you have guys like Absalom who have every gift in the world. 
you know, I mean, talented and, and attractive and smart and, and more privileged than they know, and yet all they can see is what they don't have. And everybody's holding them back, and, and, and both sides of that um, is, is devilish. I think, again, in these themes that I talk about, it's important to know that the word Satan that we talk about, about the devil, capital S, is Satan, but the Hebrew word Satan with a small s it means accuser, and that's the devil's main job, is to, to, to bark at your ear about what you don't have or, or what you did wrong. It's, it's, a, it's two sides of the same coin, how this world will never work out for you because either you're so stupid or everybody else is so stupid around you, and, and both of those things are paralyzing. They bring out the very worst parts of us, and this is where grace comes in. A son of David, a great, great, great grandson of David uh, comes along, and he's offered the devil's deal. Here's all the kingdoms of the world. Just give me your soul, and he won't take it. Rather, he carries the weight of the world on his shoulders to pay for all of us. So if you're like David, and you can't get past the one big or ten big or 500 big stupid things you've done, and every time you think about it, it just waves over you like an ocean, and, you, and you, you feel it. Well, there's grace. Sadly, there's no time machine, but there's grace. And Jesus says, I'll carry those sins for you, and I'll pay for those things, so you don't have to. And you may still have some work to do to repair a relationship with the ones you love who you hurt. There may be still some other things to do, but you and God can be square. And once you and God are square, you're going to find a new strength to be able to start working on those other things. Once you know your eternity is taken care of because he's paid for it, then you have a freedom then to deal with these things that, that we, blow our, we blow up. But even if you're like Absalom, and the reason why you're in the hole you're in right now is your stupid dad or your stupid mom or your stupid uh, situation, if that's the reason, and, and you can blame it on that, and you can point to that and say, well, clearly this is why everything has fallen apart for me. Even if that's your situation, if you hadn't married the wrong woman, if you hadn't had the idiot kids you did, if you hadn't moved to this town and there's no opportunity, if you hadn't done this, you hadn't done that, if this one thing hadn't happened, well then, even if you're in that situation, I think Jesus can breathe life into that too. Because he reminds you that no matter who you are and no matter what you've done, he loved you enough to give everything. You're the apple of God's eye. I mean, no matter what this world takes away, you can't take that away. And, and, and you're a son or daughter of the king. And this world and all the different ups and downs of this world that we, we chew our nails about, most of those things don't matter that much. And I'm an old man now talking to a lot of people younger than me, and I, I'm just telling you that a lot of those things don't matter as much as you think they do in the moment. It's just lies. The, the, the thing that matters always is not what the world can give you, but, but where your soul is. And Jesus answers that too. And so what I wanted to offer to you today, no matter which of those poles you veer between, you know, where it's all your fault or it's all somebody else's fault. I just want to give you a chance to lay that down today. Hand that to Jesus. We're going to pray at the end of the service or give you a chance to pray, and I'm going to encourage you to hand that to Jesus. Um, he loves you. He's paid for you. You may have been an accident to your parents, but you were not an accident to God. He knew you were coming long before anybody thought about what your name would be and he loves you let me pray with you right now dear lord god i i just thank you for this group god i know there's some people who come in today who are very much in the uh in the absalom camp they feel like they've not been given a fair shake in life the, the hand that they were dealt was not a fair hand um they look at others who have more talent or more money or more connections or more intellect or more whatever, and, and they don't have it, and it's not fair, God, because you've cheated them somehow. And I, I pray for all that group. If they're here today, 
I pray, God, that you remind them that you love them and that you have given them everything. I know there's also people, God, in here who would be more along David's camp, and they, they carried this enormous load of guilt for stuff they did. God, I just pray for them too, that they're able to lay this down, knowing that you've already taken it, you've already paid for it, and that they can lay this down and find peace, God, in you. In Jesus' name, amen.